This is the new Metro New York market. a jam-packed schedule from yesterday and today. So to start things off, does everyone have a pen and pad? All right, good. Does everyone here know what a broker is? Yes, all right. Do me a favor. In, let's say, one minute, this is not going to be graded. This is not going to be going to the professor later. This is just for us. Please be honest. Write the first word or phrase that comes to mind when you think of the word broker and how it relates to the food industry. Looking for honesty and transparency. There's going to be no backlash or punishment here. I just want some candid answers. Okay. Well, you're all polite here, except for right there. That was kind of hitting on what I was hoping would come out here. And in my experience over the years, one of my hardest tasks leading on the food sales is generating new business. How do we get the word out about our services to new manufacturers and brands for us to represent? And in talks with people over the years, I'd have great conversations. They, they would see me. They love my passion. They love my background, my energy, our team, everything. But when I mentioned that we are a broker, the word broker, the smiles turn to frowns. And literally, people like start taking a step back like this. And the whole conversation changed. And then over the years, I realized why. It had nothing to do with me. It was just about people in the industry as a whole. Brokers for a while, I mean, some have gotten a free pass, and really how brokers originated, the roles and duties that they had 20 years ago has evolved. All right? Back then it was you hired a broker, maybe a regional, maybe a national, and you know, maybe they had a relationship and they got you into an account, or maybe you just needed retail coverage, and you know, conveniently they could cover seven regions in the country. So you hired this person, they filled out audit sheets, and you knew, or you had peace of mind, when you put your head on the pillow at night, that you had retail coverage. And that's what it was. But now it's different. Because we are living in the craziest time the food industry has seen in the last 25 years. Right? And I know I haven't been in this industry for 30 plus years to know that. But I think we all know that. Because from everyone, all the competitors that are coming in, the things we're hearing from market leaders, the things we're hearing from independence in the market, the competition that's coming in, the money that's being thrown in by investors for alternative ways for people to get groceries, this is a very interesting time. It's a challenging time. Retailers are pressed for how to grow. Manufacturers are pressed because budgets are being limited. I don't know anyone that's being given increased funds to go do whatever they want and don't have to report back on ROI what they're getting back. What that means is there's a need for a brand advocate, someone in the middle that's advocating for that brand, whether that brand is right or wrong, whether they're going to spend it the right way or the wrong way, someone that's going to give that brand the truth about what needs to get done. Not just filling out an audit sheet and saying, okay, we're doing the retail coverage for you, but literally sitting down and doing planning for the whole year, budgeting, forecasting, allocating, financial planning, promotional analysis, warehouse stock uh, analysis, in addition to all the everyday retail coverage. And everyday retail coverage has evolved. Everyday retail coverage was going to a store, checking out, all right, they had seven of 10 items. All right, next stop. That's what it was of one of the 30 brands, like you mentioned, that they represented. All right, you can't have that, that mentality today and be successful, at least in the Metro New York market where I'm from, which is the most diverse market in the country independently owned supermarkets. In other parts of the country, you could pay money, be part of a planogram, and you know, for the most part, you could send a retail rep in there, and if you're paid to be on the planogram, then you're in, right? It doesn't happen here. Every supermarket has the ability to either add or delete from the planogram. They don't answer to anyone. You've got to do everything right by corporate, and then you have to do everything right by the owner. You cannot send in the same person that was doing your regular retail checks to go in. You basically have to treat every end user and every store 
like you're treating corporate. It's just crazy. That's a lot of effort. You need quality people. You can't send in the minimum wage workers that you were sending in, the, in there before because it sounds great when some big company tells you we have 3,000 retail reps. How many cases did you sell? What's our ACV? That's the bottom line. So in a nutshell, that's uh, what a brand advocate is. I just want to mention about St. Joe's too. Um, St. Joe's is obviously held in high regard. You know, this university is a pipeline of future leaders, not just in this area, but in the food industry as a whole. Um, and when Michael asked me to speak here, I was really happy to accept. And it brought me back to seven years ago when Omni put on a continuing education seminar in New York, mostly meat industry based. And we invited all the buyers from every account in the market. We had them all there. And I was charged with putting together a panel of who was going to speak, right? So I had uh, someone from the USDA there. I had someone from the private industry, Erner Barry, uh, a reporting, talk about forecasting for chicken prices. And I wanted to get a professor. So um, I started researching, calling, emailing professors. And Rutgers was the first one that got back to me. And a professor from Rutgers said, Zach, I'd be happy to be on your panel, but you don't want me to do it. John Stanton, write this name down. You want him. He's the guy you want. OK, wrote it down, began my search, call, email, Google, research, repeat, until I finally got a hold of the guy. It took a while, but he did agree to be on our panel. So he was there. And then we had three vice presidents from large uh, manufacturers in the protein field. They were all on this, on this panel. And we had all the buyers from our industry there. It was really a great event. And um, John Stanton was, he got high, he got low, he went left, he went wide. He was the best speaker. It was a, an amazing experience. So for me, uh, it feels great that my first great experience of a speaker in the food industry was from him. And now I'm back here speaking where he's a department chair. So I feel really great to be here. And also, there are buyers that I deal with and manufacturer reps that Omni represents that either have went here for undergrad or graduate or above or are in here now. And these are leaders in the food industry now. These are the top buyers, directors, and VPs of sales. So I'm, uh, I'm humbled to be in your presence. Thank you for having me. All right. My background. I grew up in two family businesses, a food distributor and a brokerage house. My father founded two companies around the time that I was born. Right, he took a risk, went out on his own, took out a loan, and started with one small door. He was distributing one item, oxtails in the city, in the five boroughs. And in doing that, he developed relationships with store owners. And in doing that, as his distributor grew, manufacturers saw the business growing and said, hey, would you mind representing my product too? And go sell some while you're out there. And he did, and that's how Omni was founded. So me as a young kid, literally under five years old when both companies were founded, I watched them both grow, and they're both sizable today. Uh, we're in the Hunts Point meat market in New York, and, and both companies are amongst the largest in their field. Some of my first jobs were picking orders in the refrigerated warehouse. I had the joy of waking up at 3 in the morning these are for the whole summer, going down while it was dark out, putting on five layers of clothes, hats, gloves, literally writing down pick weights of cases, stacking them on pallets, and, uh, and then loading them onto trucks. We did this long hours while my friends were you know, having more regular jobs and having fun. I was down in the South Bronx. So I did that and also worked as a truck driver's assistant. Let me tell you what, that's really hard for truck drivers. No one wants to give truck drivers the right of way on the road. Everyone's looking at them like, get out of my way. And these guys have merchandise on the back. Sometimes they get sheets that have the wrong address on them. They circle blocks multiple times. Everyone wants their product on time. And then even if you get to a place on time, a receiver may feel like being a jerk that day Say, so you know what, I'm going out to lunch. You can wait till I come back. And then you've got to wait there for an hour until he comes back. So doing these jobs, you know, I could go in more in detail about the experiences I've learned, but I mean, I've spent hours in the backs of supermarkets. I've unloaded trucks into the supermarket. I've unloaded from the back room onto the shelves because a manager said, if you unload it, then you could build whatever display you want. Those are the kinds of things that I learned and picked up. So I learned these at a young age. Meeting with customers at social events like golf outings, meetings, and dinners. The food industry is largely a relationships-based business. 
All right, technology is here, and yes, things are changing, but at the end of the day, it's a relationships-based business. Who do people feel comfortable with? Who do they know, like, and trust? I graduated from UConn in Connecticut and got my master's in Manhattanville. So I've been with Omni full-time for 11 years. I just completed my first year as president. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And it's, been a, it's been a great year. We were actually, uh, we won retail partner of the year from one of our fastest growing principals. We won this year. And that's a testament to our commitment on the retail side and customer service in the office and also account management with the account. Our three departments are retail, customer service, account management. Retail, I worked as a retail rep. I had a route of stores. I had a territory that I hit. Same stores every couple of weeks. I developed relationships with the department managers in these stores, the clerks, the receivers, the store managers, and I got things done. I learned how to get products cut onto shelves. How does this get done? You know, some stores didn't care at all. They let you do whatever you want. Other stores, you had to build up over time, show that you'd be there, be reliable, be consistent. I saw what sold, I saw what didn't sell, and I learned tricks of the trade from literally being in those routes, being in those stores, and seeing firsthand what they deal with from customers, from their, their bosses, and so forth. Customer service in the office, really important job. All right? We kind of all assume that customer service is going to be perfect all the time because they have to be, but I mean, let's be honest. Some of these people that are entering POs, if they put a decimal place one spot to the left or one spot to the right, you've got a thousand cases coming into an account instead of a hundred. Big problem, right? And like I mentioned earlier about people being kind of crunched now, retailers struggling for growth, manufacturers increased competition, where's the growth going to come from? The squeeze is on. Responsibilities are being thrown at the middleman, at the broker. The broker can do it. The broker can set up the new items. The broker can enter the promotion. And all the buyer has to do is hit approve. And if it's wrong, we're going to have the broker's neck. So again, the importance of relying on someone who's really got your back an advocate has risen. You really need to have someone that's strong back there. And account management. Knowing the ins and outs of the, of the buyers. You know, and anticipating their needs before they tell you. Because buyers are really busy. I heard about how the industry was in the past. It was just a different time. But today, it's really about warehouse management. I mean, buyers don't get out very often. I mean, they've got to make sure that their warehouse is full, and these guys are responsible for thousands of items. So it's really just having compassion for them, understanding what they need, and then serving them. I'm responsible for all the day-to-day -day functions at Omni, including maintaining contact with all principals, managing the use of time, financial resources for all executives, and generating new business. Mets fans, joining us tonight for the ceremonial first pitch is Zach Romanoff. Zach is a guest of one of our proud sponsors. Zach is also a lifelong Mets fan. Our ceremonial catcher is Wilson Ramos. Zach, it's your pitch. Nice job, Zach. This opportunity came up, and this was a lot of fun. The New York market is changing and growing, as I mentioned. There's your market leader. Key Foods is your number two by store count, close to 250 stores. And then down the list, I'm not going to mention all these, but I'm pretty sure you all know them. Um, it takes a lot of work to cover these, a lot of ground, right? All these stores add up approximately 1,200 stores. But this market is a little bit different than Florida or Chicago or Texas. This market, Metro New York, is the most ethnically diverse market in the country. It's an exciting market. It's where profiles are created. It's where trends are started. If you get items authorized here, it's kind of a starting point as to they will then shift and go to other markets. These are individually owned stores. Very unique. Very powerful. I think it's their biggest strength. And I think it's why you saw companies like A&P go bankrupt. It was because they were top heavy. Everything was done at the corporate office, and they had maybe two or three zones for 800 stores between all their different banners. These guys here take Bogopah Food Bazaar, for example. He's up there somewhere. 
two stores could be within three miles of each other. And within those three miles, their planograms are completely different. Right, you'll have upscale in one, you'll have more ethnic on the other. The retailers that survive in this challenging landscape are the ones that cater to their local communities, that understand that every store needs to be treated differently. That's what's happening. Every store is treated differently based on the neighborhood. That's why this is a broker or advocate friendly marketplace. Because, you know, I asked what word or phrase came to mind. I heard middleman a lot. But the word that I associate Omni as a brand advocate is an extension of the manufacturer. That's what we are. Those are our principles. That's who pays us. Those are our bosses. So you need quality people out there. I mean, you can't survive without one. You need to have people out there. Just from a cost standpoint, right? It would be very expensive for some brands to hire teams of 10 to 15 to 20 people, right? We all know what it costs to hire a good person nowadays with insurance and phone and car and toll. It costs about $17 to get over the George Washington Bridge. One way, you know, that's crazy. And there's a lot of building and relationship building that has to get done. So you really need to have a team and, and treat that person as an extension of your company. The intense competition, it's a crazy time, all right? Even your market leaders are pressed. Costco, they're challenging everyone. They come out with unique sized items that then everyone else wants to then replicate. Walmart, and if you're not careful as a manufacturer, you know, one of these guys could wind up being 20% of your total overall sales. And then from an efficiency standpoint, from your production cycles, if that person pulls out, it could cause, it could disrupt your flow in other parts of the country. And of course, Amazon and Whole Foods, what have we known about Amazon and Whole Foods since the merger two to three years ago? Anybody, what have we known? What has happened to Whole Foods stores the last two to three years since this merger? What's happened? Whole Foods has lowered their prices three times, right? That's a decrease in profitability. That means Amazon paid a lot of money for this asset, and now they have to invest more resources to get the same money or less out of it, right? So... There's a lot, and there's a lot of studying going on, right? Amazon's trying to study, right? There's a lot of trucks, even in the Bronx by me. I mean, Amazon's got trucks. They're coming. They're building a distribution center in the Bronx. So everything is tightening up. Like I said, this was not here. For the last 25 years, this was not here. All three of these things are all kind of coming to a head now. E-commerce site. So what's the impact on the business? It's more bark than bite, all right? At the end of the day right now, who knows what percent of all total grocery sales are purchased online versus in-store? Who knows the number? Online sales in the U.S., total grocery sales. Unfair advantage. You're the teacher. That was That's why I <laughs> sign language. That's correct. It's 3%, right? So interest rates are low at banks. People want to make return on their money. What are they doing? They're throwing it in startups. There's huge investor money going into all these places, and that's why we're hearing all the buzz about online purchasing. It is there, but it's, it's, just a, it's just a really slim part of business right now. And to answer your question about what stores are closing, some stores are closing, right? It's not a lot. I mean, I've got a pretty good pulse on, on these stores. I spend a lot of time in them and with them. Some stores close. Some guys are teetering on the brink, you know, but people got to, store owners need to do the work. Right? There's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to kind of modernize stores and get them to the level that consumers want them to be at. And for people that invest and put in the work, they're seeing the rewards to that. But if you kind of coast it and just do the same things that were done 25, 30 years ago, those stores are looking around like, why is our sales flat? So I say don't hire a broker, hire a brand advocate. There were some brokers that gave all brokers a bad name. Right? There were some brokers that the stigma... You only heard from them when they were looking for their commission check. They weren't out pro proactively building your business. So why the term advocate? You know, broker, for me, what did broker stand for? Well, I thought of broker, I thought of like stockbroker, like Jordan Belfort, the wolf of Wall Street. He would sell you stock, he didn't care what it was. He was making his commission on it. He was, that was it. I mean, broker, mortgage broker, house. Singular transaction. They help you get in, help you sell the house. You don't talk to that person ever again, right? 
A food broker is not like that at all. It's unfair to call people like us brokers because we're not brokering one-time deals. We are brokering deals every day of the year. I have buyers that call me every week, every day, and if I'm not on my game or if I'm not giving support to them or keeping things tight between the manufacturer and the retailer, they are taking that business elsewhere, right? If I'm not showing that I care, that I'm on everything, on my toes every day, the business is gone. There's something to be said for keeping your business, for having the business that you have, being flat, getting everything you had last year, because other people are out there trying to take your business every single day. We're the lifeline to the, I call on the network. It's a network of owners, buyers, supervisors, department managers that are touching your products every day. So much so that uh, three years ago, I hired a film crew, drove around the five boroughs, Jersey, and all these states, and made a video called What is the Network? And I put it on Omni's website. And it's a five minute video that basically just highlights all these different retailers and the work that's done. And within three months, different companies reached out to Omni and wanted to hire us. They're like, holy crap, you guys like, yeah, I always knew there were all these retailers and I see them when I drive around, but I didn't know how to sell to C-Town or to Fine Fair, you know, or these stores. Got to make sure your partners align with your goals and values. Our best manufacturers sit down with us way before their seasonality comes up. They say, Zach, how many of these do you think we're going to sell? How much do you think it's going to cost? If I gave you this much more money, do you think you could sell this? We literally have brainstorming sessions that are collaborative where we come up with the year's plan. And these meetings are done so well that when we're done, we know what kind of year we're going to have if we execute and do what we're supposed to do. And nine times out of ten, it comes that way. Of course, there's always some things you can't control. You can't control competition. You can't control what other items are going to come on sale. But we take pride in executing our plans. For it to work, it truly must be a respectful partnership with trust. They have to be viewed as an extension of your company. That's how you need to view it. Before I go into these, any questions? How do you balance the in-store executional work with the fact that you don't necessarily know which distributor is bringing the product the, like through the back door? Uh, we, we identify who the distributor is by account, by product line. And they don't switch back and forth? There is switching that is done. Yes. So how do you, I, I guess, it, it, is it just when you're in the store, you figure out who the product came from, like which distributor it went through? Generally, stores stick to the same or they switch between the same few, so we know. And in our opinion, you know, we kind of add all the distributors up together and track that volume as if these three distributors, you know, were all one. As long as our principles, products are growing across these three distributors, then we're doing our job. It's about increasing the awareness for that brand. Okay. And um, for everyone around the table, please weigh in. But you're a high end, higher end service, more connections, relationships, etc. So the business can go that way, high, you know, high touch, high, you know, high on the relationship scale, or it can go the other way. And how are you viewing that? I, we've invested all in on retail. The battles are won in the stores. There is so much importance of what's going on in the store. In the, in, those are the bunkers now. Buyers, like I said, don't get out, and they're all worried about fulfillment. They're all worried about keeping the cases full. It's up to people that are going into the stores, that are going out educating the deli department manager and explain to him, hey, you know, this is a great cheese, this is why, it's lost sales when you're not there. You need to put out more product. Don't be afraid to buy more. Don't be afraid to refill it two or three times a day. And now that's being done. I mean, and that's hard to do. I mean, whose job is that? Remember earlier we talked about the old broker filling out an audit sheet? Yeah, this one's here, this one's here, this one's not here. We're going out doing advanced selling on how much money they make, what gross, pro gross profit margins they're making on having these products on shelf, on lost sales. This is, this is high level stuff. You really want to think who you got out there. You know, who's going to represent you well? If any one of, one of you here got sick and then couldn't communicate with your account, do you have someone on your side that you trust to talk to that buyer? That could do it not, not just as well as you could, but good enough to keep it in a good place. So what are the five main benefits to hiring a brand advocate? 
main benefit number one is brand advocates secure appointments. Right? And I know that sounds kind of simple, but for people outside from the norm of the inside of the industry, I mean, it's hard to get buyers, right? Buyers don't pick up the phone every time. Buyers don't pick up the phone every time for me, and I'm calling them with stuff. Imagine how they react to people they don't even know. All right, I was with them two days ago. I was with a buyer yesterday. These guys' phones, they ring uncontrollably. Their bosses from above, the people they've managed beneath them, and then all the manufacturers trying to get in. I don't, I don't envy these guys either. It is a hard job, right? So buyers don't pick up the phone for every call or respond to every email, but they do respond to people that they know. Many buyers have existing relationships with brand advocates. Someone like Omni has a portfolio. We're selling across seven departments already. More than likely, there's something that I'm doing with that person that either I'm working with them directly or I'm working with one of their colleagues directly. Right? And that, give, that gives me a stamp of approval. Zach's not going to screw me. Zach's not going to say something and then not follow through. There's familiarity. How much time would it take for you to find the correct buyer's contact information? Right? Google doesn't give you all that stuff. A lot of the stuff's not listed. There are 30 supermarket chains in Metro New York alone. So, I mean, if you're going to do something on your own, you have to find all these contact information on your own, build a relationship on your own. It's, it's a lot of time. What percent of them will respond? Will they give you the attention you deserve? I mean, I've seen a lot of brands. Some people say, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to lace up my boots real tight, and I'm going to blanket this whole market myself. I'm going to work day and night. I'm going to do it. And guess what? They burn out because one person can't do it. You need a team. You need to work on an efficient level. Main benefit number two, brand advocates guide food companies with the expectations of an account before making the presentation. And this is probably my favorite one. Every customer has a unique cost of doing business. Brand advocates are familiar with them. This prepares you for what lies ahead. This is one of my favorites because this is what separates brand advocates from any other Joe on the street that claims to be a broker. Right? Any other Joe out there that claims to be a broker Oh yeah, I know X from so and so, I'll get you the appointment. You sit down and then all of a sudden all these things come up and you as the manufacturer like, you know what, I wish I would have known these things earlier because if I did, I would have kind of maybe changed my package or built this in or, or allocated for this or asked my boss for that. Right? What I love, what I take pride in is giving my manufacturers everything in advance. This makes your product presentation more effective and less we need to check and see if we can do that. Those are the worst words you can hear in a meeting. When I hear it, it's like someone takes their nails and slowly drags them down a chalkboard. I hate it because it means we're not getting to yes. Right? Buyers are so busy, we need to get to yes at that meeting or all the information needs to be given to them at that meeting so that they can make a decision. Let them go back to their boss and come back to you. But you gave them all the specs, all the pricing, all the promotions, all the product sampling, anything that they could want, they have. They can't say that you didn't give it to them. You have one chance. You have one chance. Not everybody realizes that. You have one chance to make a good first impression. The goal is to get to yes in that first meeting. So many people are so lax. So you know what? I don't want to show pricing in the first meeting. Let's just show them the product and see what he thinks. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Do you know how busy this guy is? How many competitors are trying to get this business? You need to come with your best foot forward. Right? Buyers appreciate that. If the first meeting isn't great, there may not be a second meeting. I've been part, part of those too. The main benefit number three, buyers prefer to work with people that save them time. You've heard about time, right? Warren Buffett talks about time. The only asset you know, that he can't get back is time. You can all get money. You can't get time back. A buyer's main job is to make sure his stores have product. Really, looking at new products is like farther down the list. To some of them, it's almost like a bother. Has anyone else experienced that? Yeah. Most buyers oversee hundreds or thousands of items. Each item has dozens of characteristics that make each one of them unique. 
it's dizzying to think of the amount of information these people need to know. All right? Item, pack, unit of measure, weight, block, tier, minimum ship weight, shelf life, cost, cost per pound, cost per unit, cost per box. It goes on and on. And, and multiply, it's just it's too much. It takes a lot of time for buyers to explain to each new food vendor what's expected of them. This happened to me. Buyers said, you know what? I know you guys. You guys have been selling me this for a few years. Your price may not be the lowest, but I don't want to set up another new vendor. You guys are flexible. I want to change POs. I want to move them up. I want to move them back. You guys do it with no problem, no headache. There's peace of mind in that. And this guy's most likely going to get the business, and his price is higher than other guys that are trying to get it, but it's because there's a trust and a peace of mind. Same thing, they could say one sentence to the broker, and they understand that the broker explains it to the manufacturer. When you start out fresh with a brand new person, it doesn't matter if the price is 10% less than what he's currently buying. If that vendor's gonna short him on a sale week when he's got major pulls, and now all of a sudden he's looking like a fool, and it's not all about the price. It's about the whole package. Benefit number four, brand advocates are motivated by sales to get paid. For the relationship to last, there must be sales at some point, right? We're all, I mean, for me as a salesperson, I know if I don't put up wins after X amount of time, I'm going to get fired. It's just the reality of it. So you only get a few number of cycles to go without performing and showing your impact. A good brand advocate will only enter into a partnership if they think that product will be successful. You know, when selecting your advocate or your representative, ask them what they think will be successful, right? That doesn't come, off, come out a lot. Some manufacturers just throw things on the table and say, go sell these. Go sell them all equally. But what about the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of your business comes from 20% of your products. You're having those conversations with your rep. Challenge your rep for those. If there's no sales, you end the relationship. Easy. Benefit number five, brand advocate teams save you time. Time is your biggest asset in business. Great leaders outsource and delegate to allow them to stay focused on top line concerns. Right? We need our manufacturers, when they come in, the biggest resource that they, that they provide is talking about what went into the thought, production, and technology of the products that we're selling. Brand advocates employ the best sales team, which consists of business managers, customer service, and field reps. Saving you time, recruiting, hiring, and training. It's a lot of time in itself and frustrating. Employee, employee retention rates, what do they say, about 50% on average, if you're lucky? Some places are worse. You know, brand advocate teams, Omni, I have a hand-selected team. My father's team has all retired or moved on. Over the last 11 years, I have hand-picked specialists that either came from manufacturers, retailers, other brokers, or in some cases, the banking industry, because they're really good with numbers and really good for our customer service. The cost to hire one full-time sales employee is approximately $100,000 based on salary and expenses, like I mentioned earlier, tolls, gas, mileage, food, phone allowance, car allowance, etc. With Omni, you get a team of people. They're all great. You get access to all of them. All right? Additional benefits, no legal responsibilities to direct employees like lawsuits, workers' comp, medical insurance, auto accident liability. This all adds into that 100,000. You've got business managers that are great at what they do, that talk to their buyers weekly. These are the people that you're going to educate and they're going to present your products. They're going to do it in a great way. They're enthusiastic, they know what's going on at the account, and they're trained to sell. Customer service handles all new item setups, confirms change deliveries, manages your AR, deductions. Who likes deductions? No one likes deductions, right? We get them paid back. Some, uh, I put some examples of some strong launches to show you some of the work that we've done. So this is a concept. And to give an example of what we did, the buyer says, yeah, Zach, I love it, but I'm not going to force it on any of my stores. I'll set it up. You can go out, and you can sell it. Any orders you get, tell me, and I'll place it. So our field reps, testament to our retail team, went out and collected orders so that was two years ago. Last year, we increased this to a 
So with that, what's happening? The buyer sees that we're supporting this. He's putting us in print more often. He's setting up new items more frequently because he sees that we're invested to it, that we're in the stores. And he's getting calls from his stores. Hey, Omni called me about this. I want another one. And now he's getting the calls, right? So we're helping to, to drive a buzz. This was a new product launch. I take pride in this account because we took this brand that also produces pounds annually. Omni has been in this. So we've, had, we've got a tremendous base of business. But they said, hey, can we launch our so we said, yeah, you know, we can, we can get meetings with the right people, you know, and we did it. We set it up. So some of those independents you saw, one of the challenges, you can set up programs. You can say, hey, you know what? All right, they took my slotting money. I got seven items authorized. You may look at your spin report that first month, and you sold nine cases. You're like, how the heck did that happen? I just paid 3000 bucks. That's how some of those accounts work. No forced planogram. No forced distribution going against the well-known brands. Omni's retail reps went out, met with individual stores, and built out displays like this in stores. Right? That's, that's, it takes money and time to do that. And now this program is, is several hundred thousand pounds annually. We've got trucks going in pretty regularly, weekly. We love sampling. Right? One of our principals had a truck. Zach, you want the truck? Yes, give me the truck. How many days do you want it for? How many days can I have it for? Well, we can give you five. That's it. I'll take all five. Stores fought for this truck. We had to do a second trip later in the summer because the stores went gaga having this in their parking lot, giving out free product. We lined it up. We put a hot promotion in, put it in print. We backed it up with this, and they sell out. It's a big event. It's, you know, and... These are Omni refs that man this truck. We take the expense all out of our own pocket because we are committed and invested to growing that business. This was a line a few years ago that entered a crowded space. They came to us. They had an awesome product. It tasted better than anything else that we'd ever tried. We got them to $300,000 in sales from nothing in the first year, from getting that product in front of all the right people, putting together a strategic plan, and then executing that plan, getting retailers to support that and follow through. This company was acquired, but I just want to share this, this launch. And so speaking of that specifically, combination of relationship, price, quality, service, what in this instance had you replacing and doing that? Combination or one over the other? Well... This was a unique product. There was definitely a space for it out there. It, uh, if you look at the ingredient statement, it was the only one that was all natural. It had 10 ingredients or less. So we actually made a slide for them that took the ingredient statement from each of the other four competitors, should have put it on here. And it literally read like, you know, seven, 20, 30, 40. And we put that in front of buyers and that was the, that was the sale. And that got it authorized. Someone said, you should laminate this and put it on a, on a card and put this out there. But we didn't want to put the other brands out there. But that helped. This company was very aggressive with their price. You know, we said, hey, you need to be this price point to make a difference. They gave us that. But they gave us that in advance so that we could go out and then sell it for months. And we did that and said, hey, you know, we got a hot deal way before the sale launched. And then they bought in accordingly for that. And they put it in print, too. So to recap, benefit number one, brand advocates secure appointments. Benefit number two, brand advocates guide food companies with the expectations of an account before making the presentation so that you can get to yes on the first call or as close to yes as you can get. But everything has been presented to them. All the information is on their desk. They have everything they need to make that decision. Benefit number three, buyers prefer to work with people who save them time. Benefit number four, brand advocates are motivated by sales to get paid. We know that if we don't perform, you're going to make a change. Benefit number five, brand advocate teams save the manufacturer time and give you more resources and more feet on the street, hands on the desk, and people in the buyer's offices. A little bit about Omni Food Sales. Proudly celebrating our 26th anniversary this year. There's been a lot of change over those 26 years. There were a lot of regional brokers that were acquired by national brokers, 
and, uh, and Michael, as you mentioned about Acosta, that trend might, is going back to the regional brokers because the, the biggest and the smartest brands realize that maybe there was a cost savings with having an Acosta that charged a flat percent and you got 2,000 reps from California to Florida to New York. But over time, it's better to have a specialized expert in each market. And maybe with Acosta, you know, there were people not doing a lot of running around up top. Not enough people running around at the bottom. Omni represents brands in these departments and totals over in retail sales annually. We call in all the, all the retailers that you saw earlier, 30 plus. And our mission statement is simple. Increase sales for our principals and customers. Question around best practices. When a retailer, and retailers do this with their buyers, and they shuffle the deck, okay, they move their buyers around, what's, what's, what are the best practices to get in there and handle that relationship when you're walking in and there's a, that they've shuffled the deck? You have to deal with it. I've had three different buyers in five years. And at each one, I had to start at zero with the new buyer. It's just part of it. You just have to adjust. You have to build your reputation with a new person again. You have to explain to them where this came from. And you just have to show how committed you are, the resources you're putting towards it. I don't see any other way around it. Okay, so you started getting into, which was one of my questions, which should be everybody's, is what went wrong in Acosta? There are things that are public that we've heard about, but, you know, so you, you had said uh, probably a reversal of the trend. Yeah. I mean, one of our principals was with Acosta five years ago. They were fed up. There was no sense of urgency, not returning phone calls, not answering emails, and just getting ignored. Before it was popular to leave Acosta, they did. They hired Omni, and we've proved them right over the last five years. And I think you're going to see other brands start to, to leave that leave that company as well. You know, it's just not, it's not feasible. I mean, what are you getting for what you pay for? That's a good question too. I mean, a good advocate is going to cost an extra percent or two, but you're going to get it in return. What's it going to cost for you instead of your business being flat to be up 20%? The national brokers, they provide this, you don't have to interview different markets. We, but New York and Boston and upstate New York are so different. I mean, some of the brands that we represent that we've had for 20 years, they know, hire an expert in each market and let them tell us how to do it there. They realize that they're as good as we are. And we're as good as they are. It's a real team. Final thoughts? So, they'll go one of two ways. They'll go higher touch with you, or they'll leave Acosta and go to uh, just a gig walk, uh, just the, the basics. Right, another national that claims to do that. So. There's not a whole lot of nationals out there, though. Right. And you get a little bit of the same <clears throat> everywhere. Right. No, it's true. It's true. I take pride in my role. I love my role at Omni. I'm a legacy. There's a lot of pressure that comes with that. I'm well aware that, you know, 30% of family businesses make it into the second generation, and then 10% make it to the third. You know, I'm well aware of that. I understand why, because I saw how my father grew up and how I grew up. And it's different. You know, number one, someone has to have the ability to do it. Then they have to want to do it. Those are two really hard things. And, uh, you know, I've got the ability to do it, and I want to do it. So I'm really happy. I'm really satisfied. I love the team that we put together. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing watching this team that we put together because I love it when things are moving so fast that it doesn't have to be me giving the command for things to happen. It's beautiful when mid-level managers and even lower level managers take the initiative and are doing things on their own because everyone has this sense of belonging in our team. And it's, uh, it's amazing to watch because I was, I was there with a whole different team years ago. And you know, now we're all together. So before wrapping up, I had uh, one thing. Rachel, do you have those bags? Can you bring them up, please? And everyone, this is Rachel Lembo. I recruited Rachel from here at St. Joe's seven years ago. You know, we recruited three people at the same time, and Rachel just showed uh, an overwhelming commitment to getting things done. She's in our office, but she didn't start in that position. She started out in the field. 
And as opportunities arose within Omni, you know, Rachel was like, I'll take, I'll take it, I'll do it. Things that I didn't think of, she took. And she just grew with it. And now she's trained other people in our office to make them clones of her. So, and she has a reputation, you know, with principals and customers of getting things done. So again, another connection at St. Joe's. I have a surprise here for anyone who can answer this question. All right, and the question is, there was a, a survey done about a year or two ago about consumer shopping preferences. And a group of consumers was asked, what would be your number one request to enhance the store shopping experience? From store cleanliness, to lighting, to getting there, to size of the aisles, to register, to people, customer service, options, etc. What was the number one thing that came back consumers request to make the overall store shopping experience better? Anybody here go to Costco? Yeah. Oh, sample. demo. Thank you very much. Product sampling. So the special prize you're going to get is Omni's 2020 shirt, <laughs> complete with our new term, brand advocate, on the back. Hot off the press, no one has these yet. <laughs> and Michael, for uh, inviting us down, we got one here for you too. This one in black. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. It's uh, the podcast, the work that we observe, and then the events. Yeah. 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 <laughs> kind of cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah.